Welcome to the teaching ministry of Kungsvinger Lutheran Church. Kungsvinger is a beacon for the gospel of Jesus Christ and is located on the plains of northwestern Minnesota. We proclaim Christ and Him crucified for our sins and salvation by grace through faith alone. And now, here's a message from Pastor Chris Roseborough. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time, he had worn no clothes. He had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion. For many demons had entered him, and they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. In the name of Jesus. So we've got a dark topic today, and we're going to be talking about, well, demons. But we'll also get a healthy dose of Jesus in there. I remember the late Walter Martin he talked about the importance of understanding that we actually face as Christians a very serious and deadly foe. And those who do not recognize this foe, well, they're like ostriches. They stick their head in the sand. But in a battle like this that we find ourselves in against an enemy like the devil and his demons, well, a Christian ostrich with its head in the sand will find itself having the flaming darts of the enemy sticking out of its, well, rear end. (laughs) Right? So let us not be like that. All right? Let us understand that demons are real. And what we'll be doing today, we're going to be looking at how the demonic even affects our own lives. And we need to recognize it for what it is. Because what we find in this text is the very sad story, but ends, has a good ending, of a man who literally was overcome by the demonic to the point where he was literally out of his mind. Right. And Jesus heals him. And the reality is, is that we all still face the demonic and each and every one of us were born under the dominion of darkness. This is a true fact of scripture. And as we will see, the devil still desires to, well, deceive you and woo you back under his dominion. And there's a way in which he does it very specifically, which we'll look at today. So with that, we're going to be looking at our gospel text. We begin, it says, then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes. This is Jesus and his entourage of disciples. They sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite of Galilee. You can read into that pagan territory. In fact, if you were to travel to the Holy Land, not that I've done that, I've done it, well, via Google Earth and things like that. I, I, I traveled the world using other people's vacation photos. But there's a very important site near this region, near this, this territory, which, well, is the temple of Zeus. The temple of Zeus. They worshipped, well, pagan deities here. This is idolatry that we're talking about. And it's important for us that we understand what's going on when it comes to idolatry. Let me read a little bit more and then we'll do some cross-reference work. Here's what it says. When Jesus had stepped out on the land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. 
So here we got a man who is demon possessed in pagan territory and very close to this site, this war this took place, is the temple of Zeus. Let me draw your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, which reveals to us the true nature of this type of idolatry, where Paul discusses whether or not we as Christians have the freedom to, well, eat food that is sacrificed to idols. Paul says something very important there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting at verse 14, Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. He's writing to Christians. Flee from idolatry. Remember the first commandment. You will have no other gods before me. So Paul, writing to Christians, says we need to flee from idolatry. Idolatry is a real threat here. He says, I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Well, of course it is. The answer is yes to that, talking about the Lord's Supper. The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Again, the answer is yes. Yes, indeed it is. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? The answer to the question is, yes, indeed they are. So what do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? Your translation may say, or that an idol has existence. That's a good way to translate this as well. You know, just because somebody worships Zeus, does that mean that Zeus exists? No. Indeed, Zeus does not exist. In fact, if you were to call Zeus right now, you'd get the doo-doo-doo. We're sorry, the number you're trying to reach is no longer in service, right? Never was in service anyway, right? So what then is going on? with all of this idolatry going on. Paul then says this, No, I imply what pagans sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. Let that one roll around in your head for a minute. Is Scripture literally teaching that people who are making sacrifices to Shiva, Vishnu, even Allah, that they are sacrificing and following demons? Answer, yes. That's what we're talking about here. All of these other religions set up in the world, they are not different paths that lead to the same God, if by that you mean eternal life. These are religions animated and, well, made possible by the demonic. And you need to consider that. This is what Scripture says. So what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons, not to God. I don't want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? No, we're not. Another cross reference. One that hits a little closer to home. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 says this. Paul, writing again under the inspiration of the Spirit, says, Now the Holy Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith. They will leave Christianity, is what he's saying, and here's why. By devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the doctrines of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. So think of it this way. When we look at the grand sweep of idolatry out there, and there's a lot out there, you can take a look at the world religions. This is animated by demons. But within the visible church, there are people who are liars, who are following deceitful spirits and are literally teaching the doctrines of demons. You can think of it as a Christianized veneer for what it really is, idolatry. You want to see what that looks like? Turn on TVN or God TV. That's what this looks like. That's what he's referring to. So keep in mind, the demonic desires to deceive you and put you back under the dominion of darkness. Important point. We return now to our gospel text. For a long time, this demoniac had worn no clothes. I'm sure that was a sight to see. He had not lived in a house, 
but among the tombs. You can think what a tortured soul this man is. Now, the church father, Cyril of Alexandria, when he preached on this text, made an interesting point. Here's what he said. In great misery and nakedness, this man wandered among the graves of the dead. He was in utter wretchedness, leading a disgraceful life. He was proof of the cruelty of the demons and a plain demonstration of their impurity. Whoever they possess and subject to their power at once, they make him an example of great misery, deprived of every blessing, destitute of all sobriety, and entirely deprived even of reason itself. So consider this. One of the things that this text is showing us is the true nature of the demonic. It'll befriend you at first, and then subject you to it, and then deprive you of even reason itself. This is how the demonic works. They're not our friends. Now, coming back to the point I was making, I'd like to do a little cross-reference work in the epistle of Jude. Jude, starting at verse 3. There's only one chapter there. The half-brother of Jesus writes, Beloved, although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation... I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And here's the reason why. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and denying our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, I want to remind you, Jude writes, that although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay with their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under great gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Little note here. The demonic, what the demons are, are fallen angels. Scripture doesn't tell us when the coup d'etat took place, but we know some of the details of the coup d'etat that took place in heaven. Lucifer, that's his name. Lucifer, who actually stood in the presence of God himself, well, became quite conceited and stuck on himself and wanted to be higher than the Most High God himself. And somehow through whatever machinations of his sick mind, deceived and recruited one-third of all of the angels of heaven to join him in a rebellion against God. And they were cast down to earth. That's where the demons come from. And you'll notice in Jude here, Jude uses this phrase, that they are kept under gloomy darkness, eternal chains until the judgment of the great day. And I highlight that phrase for a very specific reason. Because Jude here is talking about the demonic, but in just a second he's going to talk about the deceivers in the church, the idolaters who are doing the work of the demons. And he says of them that their eternal fate is the exact same fate as the demonic. And the reason is quite simple. They're doing the, de the, the demonic bidding. They're teaching doctrines of demons. So, Jude continues, Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, you can read into that phrase, homosexuality, pursued unnatural desire, they serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yeah, Jude right there makes it very clear that God does not bless same-sex sex attraction or marriage or anything of the sort. And anybody who says, in the name of Jesus, God is blessing these things, is a liar and a deceiver and teaching contrary to Scripture. In fact, I would argue they are teaching doctrines of demons. He continues, yet in like manner, these people, these false teachers, listen to their description here, they rely on their dreams, they defile the flesh, they reject authority, and they blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, 
and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them. They walk in the way of Cain, abandon themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error. They perished in Korah's rebellion. Some time ago here at Kongsvinger, I actually noted that these three men, Cain, Balaam, and Korah, represent kind of like the three major types, if you would, of false teachers. Cain is the guy who goes through all the religious motions but has no faith, offers sacrifices but doesn't love or even truly trust in God. Korah, well, he led a rebellion against Moses, Basically saying that everybody is special, everybody's holy, and you, Moses, have usurped your authority and you have made yourself a prince over us. This is an example of what we call the Yantaloven spirit, and you can find it in number 16. It is Korah's rebellion, which does not properly recognize the offices that God has established in his own church. And Balaam's error, well, Balaam is the guy who, well, he's a prophet for profit, is the best way to put it, you know. When the coin in the coffer clings, I'll give you a vision from God. Right? That's what Balaam's all about. And those are your three primary types of false teachers. But Jude writes about them. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts. As they feast with you without fear, they are shepherds who feed only themselves. And by feeding themselves, that means they basically have a vacuum cleaner that wonderfully and quite efficiently is able to suck the money right out of your wallet into theirs. They are fruitless trees in late autumn. They're twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame. They are wandering stars, stars by which you cannot navigate, for whom the gloom, listen to this, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. The same fate the demons will face, these false teachers will face as well. Peter writing about them in 2 Peter says this, Verse 1, but false prophets also rose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Oh, what a passe word that word is. Heresies, you still use that term? Oh yeah, we do. It's a biblical word. They will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And sadly, Peter prophesies that many will follow their sensuality, their self-abandonment is a good way to translate that word. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed, and in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, their destruction is not asleep. Verse 17 of that chapter then says this, these are waterless springs, mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. Same fate the demons will face, these false teachers will face. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. And I say all of this for a very important reason. We must recognize the false teachers for what they are. They are teaching the doctrines of demons. And our text today shows us where that ends up. Back to our gospel text. So when Jesus saw, or when he saw Jesus, the demoniac cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Church Father Hilary of Poitiers, he noted the fact that Well, it seems the demons have a better Christology and a better understanding of Jesus than the heretics do. Isn't that bizarre? So the demon said, I beg you, do not torment me, for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus asked him, what is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him, and they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. Note this fact that we're still technically in geographically in Israel, and there in Israel they have a large herd of pigs. 
Jews don't eat bacon. Okay? So what's going to happen next, in part, is a judgment. Keep that in mind. It's a judgment. So they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. They begged him to let them enter these. So Jesus gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man, entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. And all of the farmers and guys who've actually raised animals are sitting there trying to calculate the cost of this disaster. It's getting up there, right? Yeah, well, one pig costs this much. Herd has this many in it. Ooh, I hope they're going to be able to write this off on their taxes. Right? This is a huge loss. Cyril of Alexandria, again, in his sermon on this text, says this. We may also learn this from what befell the herd of swine. Wicked demons are cruel. They're mischievous. They're hurtful, treacherous to those who are in their power. The fact clearly proves this because they hurried the swine over the precipice and drowned them in the waters. Christ granted their request so that we might learn from what happened to that, to that, that their disposition is ruthless. Demons are bestial, incapable of being softened, and solely intent on doing evil to those whom they can get into their power. So notice the demons didn't care a hoot about how much that herd of pigs cost. Go ahead and throw us into those pigs. <laughs> right? Again, once you see it, you can't unsee it. If there's anyone, Cyril of Alexandria continues, if there's anyone among us who is wanton, who's swinish, filth-loving, impure, and willingly contaminated with the abominations of sin... God permits such a one to fall into the power of the demonic and sink into the abyss of damnation. So let us flee all sin, especially idolatry. The text continues, When the herdsmen saw what had happened, this is where it gets interesting, they fled and told it in the city and the country. Then the people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Fear overcomes them. Now, there are some today who falsely teach that you can't even begin to preach the gospel today until you are able to demonstrate with signs and wonders and miracles the power of the kingdom of God. This is what they say, and it's complete nonsense. Here... Jesus has demonstrated his power and the power of the kingdom of God by casting the demons out of this man, which none of them could do, which resulted in the loss of all of these pigs. And rather than repent and revival break out in this region, they instead have the exact same response to Jesus that the demons did. Are you here to torture us, Jesus? Right? The demons were afraid of Jesus, and now these people are afraid of Jesus. How is this possible? They're under the dominion of darkness. They think good is evil, and they believe that evil is good. They do not see God's judgment for what it is. And so rather than ask Jesus to be merciful to them, to forgive them, to set them free from the demonic, they instead act just like the demons acted, afraid of Jesus. Those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed, and then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. You see, that's what happens. The demonic causes you to literally be out of your mind how is it that they would fear jesus rather than love him how is it that they would be afraid of him rather than see him as their liberator sad isn't it that's what idolatry does so they asked jesus to depart so jesus got into the boat and he returned which is a judgment in and of itself. Fine, Jesus says. 
have it your way. So the man, though, a little bit of a gospel note here, the man from whom the demons had gone out begged that he might be with Jesus. And that's kind of the little gospel thing in here. But see, Jesus doesn't need to physically be with people. Jesus is God in human flesh. There is no place that Jesus is not. And this is why Jesus says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so Jesus, although he will not physically be with this man, will be with this man. And so he says to them, and here's what he says, return to your home. Declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. This former demoniac now becomes a gospel preacher. And he's going everywhere saying, listen, let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. I was under the dominion of darkness, out of my mind, living among the tombs, cutting myself. I wouldn't even keep clothes on me. I was quite the wreck. I was powerless to free myself from these demons, but Jesus had mercy on me. And he cast the demons out and restored my right mind. And you say, well, that's a great story for him. But I would remind you what Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Here's what it says. God has delivered us from the dominion of darkness. And he, God, has transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. You see, the story of this demoniac is actually the story of all Christians. Although not all of us, few of us have actually been possessed by demons, still all of us were born under the dominion of darkness, under the power of the demonic realm. And Christ has powerfully set us free and liberated us and cast the demons out of our lives. Where did he do this? In the waters of our baptism or when we heard the gospel for the first time and were brought to penitent faith in Christ. And now kind Jesus, who is so different than the demons. He now sustains us in the faith by feeding us with his word. And on communion Sundays, feeds us with his very body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus is the good shepherd. He is the exact opposite of the demonic. Jesus cares nothing about himself. Rather than feed himself, he feeds us. Rather than being in it for him, Jesus lays down his life so that we might live. He is the exact opposite of the demonic. And so I come back to the point that I made earlier. The demonic is at work, visibly, in the church today. How can you spot it? Simple. Does the teaching of the person who is behind the pulpit or on the stage point you to your crucified and risen Savior Or does he point you to yourself? Or worse, does he point you to him? At the end of the day, do you feel like you're not fed and all you've done is write a large check, sowed a big seed offering, or expected to pay God some money so that you can receive a miracle? See, Jesus doesn't do miracles for a price. He laid down his life freely for you and gives you salvation and healing and eternal life as a gift. You can always tell the demonic is always in it for me where Jesus is always in it for you. That's the difference. Demons are cruel, self-centered, egotistical, little false gods. Jesus is God in human flesh and although he was equal with God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself and became obedient, even obedient to the point of death on the cross. And he did it for you so that you can live. Truly, we have been delivered from the dominion of darkness. Let us not squander our liberation by chasing after the demonic, either in sin or in idolatry. In the name of Jesus, amen.
If you would like to support the teaching ministry of Kungsvinger Lutheran Church, you can do so by sending a tax-free donation to Kungsvinger Lutheran Church, 15950, 470th Avenue Northwest, Oslo, Minnesota, 56744. And again, that address is Kungsvinger Lutheran Church, 15950, 470th Avenue Northwest, Oslo, Minnesota, 56744. We thank you for your support. All of our teaching messages may be freely distributed as long as you do not edit or change the content of the message. And again, thank you for listening.